I lost that thing. I should... <laughs> Angela, say when you say when. Yeah. Ready? Okay. Good evening and welcome. It is always such a great pleasure to introduce the Longwood Seminars. And this is a special program because it's our final one for 2015. So thank you for joining us. I'm Gina Vild. I'm the Associate Dean for Communications and External Relations at Harvard Medical School. I'm so thrilled to see so many members of the Longwood Seminar community. And you are a community because you come back year after year. And we're delighted to see you. But you come together to learn about health, science, and medicine. We had a full house for all the past seminars, and this is no exception. So thank you for taking your time to join us. I know many of you have participated in conversations via our many social media channels. You might be interested to know that our mini med school Twitter account has reached more than a half a million people worldwide. And our audience for these seminars is far greater than those who are in this auditorium with us tonight. In fact, this year for the first three seminars, they were viewed by people in 30 countries, including Ethiopia, the Ukraine, Vietnam, and Guatemala, proving that biomedical research is of universal interest and is a universal language. So to all of you who are watching through live streaming, we welcome you too. I also want to share with you that 300 people earned certificates this year. And for those tonight, know that we were impressed by your interest and we honor your achievement. So please give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Certificates may be picked up in the lobby after the seminar. And if you're a teacher and have earned professional development points, we will mail those certificates to you. Within the next few weeks, we'll be sending you an electronic survey. If you receive it, please do give us your feedback. We want to know what you thought, and your ideas will help build next year's programs. So thank you for that. If you do not have internet access, please ask for a form in the lobby. At this time, I ask that you please silence the ringing of mobile devices, but do keep your cell phone on and join our conversation with others in the room and around the globe via Twitter using hashtag HMS Minimed and hashtag global health. And if you missed any of this year's seminars or would like to see any of those from past years, please view our Harvard Medical School Longwood, Longwood uh, Medical School um, se seminar page. Before I introduce this evening's program, I'd like to ask Angela Alberti to please come forward. So this is Angela's first year organizing and managing the Longwood seminars. And I hope you agree she's done an outstanding job. Yeah. So Angela, thank you for all of your good work. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight's seminar is called Diseases Gone Global, What Causes Epidemics? It's been said that the gate of history turns on small hinges. Throughout time, infectious disease caused by microscopic bacteria, by invisible viruses, or minute parasites have served as these tiny hinges, and they've shaped our human history. Although many of these organisms live in and on our bodies and are normally quite harmless and even helpful to us under certain conditions, others can cause serious disease. From the Black Plague, from the Black Death in, in the 14th century to the influenza pandemic of 1918 and recent outbreaks of tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, and Ebola, Infectious diseases have swept through cities and countries, transforming populations, politics, health systems, and entire economies. We have been at war with these tiny microbes. Despite advances in antibiotics, immunizations, and improved public health measures, infectious disease remains a major cause of morbidity and mortality in much of the world. The appearance of new infectious diseases and the reemergence of old ones, often in drug-resistant forms, pose an ongoing threat to global health security and bring renewed urgency to meet the challenges of predicting where will those new outbreaks occur, and of developing treatments and creating resilient healthcare systems. Scientists at Harvard Medical School are not only focused on understanding the genetics, 
and the biology and transmission of infectious diseases, but they are applying the scientific findings to improve control and the prevention of outbreaks. I'm delighted to introduce this, these exemplary members of our Harvard faculty who are studying infectious disease, developing the response in emerging outbreaks, and helping the medical community counter infectious disease more swiftly. We're very, very pleased and privileged to have you join us tonight. Dr. Megan Murray is a Harvard Medical School professor of global health and social medicine and director of research for global health and social medicine. Dr. Paul Farmer is a Colotronis University Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine and Head of the HMS Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. But first you'll hear from Dr. Don Goldman. Dr. Goldman is a Harvard Medical School Professor of Pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital and Professor of Immunology and Infectious Diseases and Professor of Epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So thank you again for joining us this year. Please, I hope to see you back next year, and please welcome our moderator. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. This is a great environment, and I appreciate the introduction. Uh, we've decided we're all going to say a few more words about ourselves when we come up here. So uh, in addition to those roles at Harvard that you heard about, uh, I am an infectious disease specialist at Boston Children's Hospital, and I'm chief medical and scientific officer at a not-for-profit organization called the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And our mission is to really try and improve health and healthcare worldwide. Uh, importantly for this kind of learning, I'm the faculty lead for something called the Open School for Health Professionals. Uh, and I'm proud to say that 1.6 uh, million courses have been completed by students worldwide, and we have nearly 800 chapters of faculty and students around the globe. So it's great to be here. But uh, most of all, I really, really get excited about uh, epidemics. Uh, I was an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Here's my diploma. Don't look at the year because I think I'm younger than that. Uh, but I do want you to notice the little logos around the edge that look like the soles of shoes. And the most important thing to notice there is the little holes in the uh, soles uh, because this is shoe leather epidemiology. We're all tempted to sit on our computer and figure it out, but Paul, Megan, myself will tell you, you got to get out there and do some work on the ground to really make a difference. Uh, so Megan mentioned the plague, and here's somebody suiting up against the plague in the, in the uh, 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 15th century. Uh, and you can see they're wearing all this clothing and a big mask, and that mask has a beak on it which has herbs in it designed to counter the miasmas or the stench, those filthy vapors emanating from rotting material that were thought to spread uh, the plague. So miasma, that was the way we thought diseases were uh, spread uh, for centuries. Uh, and here you have a picture of the Thames River and the stink arising from that. That was thought to cause cholera until John Snow, one of the first epidemiologists, uh, went to the Broad Street pump, which had been contaminated uh, with uh, cholera, actually from the diaper of a child who uh, had cholera. Uh, and he took the uh, uh, handle off that pump, and that ended that cholera epidemic, showing that it wasn't miasmas from the Thames. It was water contaminated water that uh, spread cholera, as we found out recently uh, in Haiti. So when you're thinking about epidemics, uh, it's important to know how each and every organism that causes epidemics is spread. If you don't understand how they spread, you can't really figure out how to control them. I'm not going to go through everything on this slide. It's just to show you that uh, different organisms do spread in various ways. Uh, just as an example, if I happen to have a staphylococcal boil on my hand and I shook hands with Paul, Paul may be in trouble because I could, by direct contact, uh, give him a staphylococcal infection. If I picked up a animal infected with a uh, plague, say, say uh, a, a, a rodent in the southwest of the United States, I could directly acquire a plague which still exists in that part of the country. Uh, or contaminated blood or body fluids could transmit directly 
uh, HIV, hepatitis, or Ebola. Uh, if I have whooping cough, which I don't, uh, and I were to spit on somebody here in the front row, it's about three feet that I've got to get close enough. That's how we spread whooping cough, uh, and so on. I'll just mention a, uh, one or two others. Uh, fungi can be spread by the air. The spores of fungi, an organism called coccidiomycosis, spreads for hundreds of miles on the air in parts of California and even out of state, uh, causing uh, lung infection. Uh, uh, vectors, uh, which are basically insects, spread malaria, dengue, chukagunya vi virus, a lot of uh, infections. You may be already fearing the emergence of ticks after the long, hard winter that can cause Lyme disease. So uh, this is important to know for epidemiologists such as myself, but basically be afraid. Be very afraid. Epidemics lurk everywhere. This is what my wife tells dinner guests. Don't even think about talking shop with my husband. If you listen to him, you will not want to eat or drink anything or get near anyone, and you probably will be afraid to leave your house. This is not a joke. This is actually true. Uh, I, I don't have many friends uh, because of this. <laughs> I, I have a couple. <laughs> Give me a break. Uh, so uh, this is my uh, first uh, outbreak investigation when I was at CDC uh, as an EIS officer. Uh, in those days, uh, we were monitoring uh, bloodstream infections due to bacteria, and we didn't really have very sophisticated methods, so we were following uh, something called Enterobacter. But buried within Enterobacter was another organism called Erwinia. Erwinia happens to be a pathogen of sugarcane. Uh, and so when they were making intravenous fluids in Abbott Laboratories, intravenous fluids that contain dextrose or sugar, the sugar in that manufacturing plant made it into the IV fluid through the screw top uh, containers that were used to store the IV fluid, and they grew in the glucose, in the dextrose, so that when it was infused in the arms of hundreds of people around the United States, they got sepsis, they got bloodstream infections, and that's that big spike. And we didn't recognize it as well as we would today because we didn't really have the microbiologic methods that we have today. And we delayed the recognition of this by some months. And this was a lethal national epidemic due to contaminated IV fluids. Quality control is somewhat better today, but people who live in Greece and other countries may remember not many years ago there were epidemics of a similar nature uh, in your countries. Uh, don't go to a, a, a zoo, and, and by all means, don't have a pet. Uh, <laughs> These are pictures of Komodo dragon and turtles, uh, both of which carry salmonella. Uh, don't eat or drink. Uh, raspberries, sprouts, even orange juice, uh, certainly uh, hamburgers and chicken, uh, even milk, uh, and definitely water, all can harbor dangerous bacteria and other kinds of organisms that can make you really, really sick. And unfortunately, in this country, U U.S., our, our methods in agriculture and in animal husbandry aren't quite as good as they should be, and our supply chain that supplies the food and hamburger doesn't really screen as well as we should for those pathogens. So uh, be careful. Now, one of the most interesting outbreaks I've uh, uh, encountered was, when, again, when I was at CDC. Uh, this was the middle of the summer, and we got reports uh, that there were people getting dysentery. Shigella is a GI pathogen that causes dysentery. And uh, I don't know if you've ever taken one of these trips, but rafts uh, go down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon, uh, and it's really, really wonderful. There are many companies that run these. That summer, there were more than 20 rafts that were affected by severe dysentery. People were being car uh, transported out by helicopter. You can get out by donkey, but I'll tell you, if you have dysentery, getting out by donkey is an awfully slow trip. The temperatures at the floor of the canyon were about 120 degrees, so you can imagine the dehydration caused by this severe diarrhea. When I arrived there, these calls always come in on Friday night. I was greeted by a park ranger, and, and I'm, I'm sorry for what I have to say here, but this is true, and, and it reflects somehow how we mistakenly think about disease. He said, Doc, he said, glad you're here, but we already solved it. It's the engines. I said, it's the what? He said, it's the Havasupai engines. They're dirty, they 
uh, defecate, he used another word, in the creek. Uh, and the river people are drinking out of, the, uh, out of the Colorado River and they're getting the Shigella dysentery. So that's what it is. And of course, I set out to prove that was wrong because what an outrageous thing to say. And it was actually due to the fact that the people who run those boats, the men and women, lived up the top of that river and they uh, uh, kind of lived intimately and they were exchanging Shigella, this organism, amongst themselves, getting on the boats preparing tuna salad and messing with the latrines on the beaches, and they were contaminating the entire uh, boat. So this was an outbreak caused not by the Havasupai, who've lived for centuries in peace at the base of the uh, Grand Canyon on the Colorado River, uh, but rather by people who didn't know how to practice uh, sanitation. Barry Goldwater said, if you don't clean up your act, I'm closing down raft trips. People don't realize he was a great environmentalist. This is an outbreak of measles due to the Special Olympics in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Those of you who've been there know there was a big domed stadium there. Uh, and a Special Olympian marched in the, uh, in the Special Olympics from Argentina. And he had flagrant acute measles that wasn't recognized. This measles traveled uh, by tracer studies all the way up to the top of that stadium, 30 meters high and far away from the track. And these bars all represent cases that occurred as a result of that exposure. And you can see the red bars are secondary cases who people who got sick by having been exposed to the people who caught uh, measles. And as you know, due to uh, immunization failures in this country, people who don't want to get immunized, we're having a resurgence of measles and other diseases like this. This is an airborne disease uh, that is spread very far on small particles that we uh, uh, spit out when we uh, talk. This is an outbreak of influenza on an airliner that was going uh, between two places in Alaska. Uh, it uh, stopped uh, to take on passengers and refuel. Uh, and while it was stopped there, the air handling system wasn't working. It got very stuffy. Somebody on that plane had acute influenza. And all of those boxes are people who caught influenza from this one case on this uh, airline uh, while it was stopped on the tarmac. So even though influenza we generally think of as being spread by doorknobs and by spit or by shaking hands and close contact, some of those mechanisms I showed you on the earlier slide, it can be spread by the air and this is a good example of when that can occur. You all probably remember SARS, uh, this acute respiratory uh, syndrome that uh, emanated from uh, a uh, apartment complex in Hong Kong. Uh, these are the uh, kind of a sketch of the towers that were part of that complex. Uh, you may know that when you're in a hotel or other building, there are these uh, pipes or stacks that uh, eliminate vapors from the uh, toilets and other parts of the sewage uh, of that uh, kind of a building. Uh, the SARS, which uh, can be carried in the gastrointestinal tract and sheds in uh, feces when we poop, uh, were going up that stack and out the top of the buildings and you can see the spread of them on the natural air currents that were occurring there and were infecting people living in other uh, apartments in these uh, towers. This is a, a classic airborne disease but also SARS survives really well in the environment, really well on hands, really well on surfaces uh, in large numbers uh, and very hard to control the spread of that. You may remember the fear that permeated uh, healthcare in the United States. Uh, we never really had a problem with SARS here for reasons that aren't clear. Uh, the epidemic uh, waned and was controlled, uh, it, but it did cause a number of uh, illnesses, including in hospital workers in Toronto. This does remind me that people who work in healthcare are especially prone to being the first victims of outbreaks, especially in resource poor settings, whether you take Ebola or MERS-CoV, which I'll mention in a minute, another virus that causes respiratory symptoms, or SARS, the people who don't recognize it or don't have adequate ways to protect themselves are the first to fall victim. And, and history is riddled with outbreaks that have first and foremost affected those trying to give help and succor uh, to the affected uh, people who come to their facilities. Now, 
I like to talk a lot about uh, antibiotic resistance. My wife, who teases me about my uh, paranoia about germs, uh, also uh, keeps uh, chiding me on the lack of progress on things I care about. And I care a lot about controlling antibiotic resistance. And uh, just last uh, week, I was talking about this, and she said, you've been coming home and talking about the spread of antibiotic resistance for 30 years. Why haven't you done anything about it? So uh, it is a challenge. Uh, and I'm just going to briefly tell you where antibiotic resistance comes from, because I know that uh, some of you are afraid of MRSA or MRSA or other antibiotic resistant pathogens. You may have read in the Globe or in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal about uh, NDM1 or New Delhi metallo-beta-lactamase organisms that are untreatable by any antibiotic we have today. Where do they come from? Well, you may not uh, have thought about this, but there is natural resistance in the environment. Uh, a colleague who's passed on, uh, Bob Mollering, uh, went to uh, Samoa, where they had never used antibiotics at that time, and found antibiotic-resistant E. coli, which is a normal uh, member of our bacteria in our gut, uh, growing in people and in the soil samples around their dwellings, even though they'd never seen antibiotics. And when you think about it, this is not surprising. Most antibiotics traditionally have come from fungi. We screen fungi and we find antibiotics. In fact, uh, you may remember penicillin uh, came from a fungus uh, the, that was discovered by accident uh, in, in the laboratory. So bacteria have had to deal with these antibiotics in their natural environment for millennia, if not longer, and they've developed genetic resistance to some of these uh, antibiotics. So that when we see antibiotics now in the modern era, the bacteria already have some clues as to what they need to do to mutate or change genetically to become resistant to those drugs. And it really is uh, somewhat of a problem that bacteria not only mutate rapidly, very rapidly, because they it kind of multiply every 20 minutes, except for your TB, Megan. That takes forever, it seems like. But most really uh, multiply quickly. So mutations occur and spread very uh, rapidly. Uh, then when we give antibiotics, we select out those resistant bacteria. We kill all the good bacteria we normally have in our bodies and select out for those resistant ones, which then proliferate. Then we bring people into crowded quarters, be it a intensive care unit of a hospital, or in some cases a prison, or an athletic facility, uh, or a, uh, a mine in South Africa where coal miners uh, um, and diamond miners got uh, rapid spread of in infections, uh, and then they amplify. And so now we have a lot of people who are carrying the organism, not just one or two. And then we have global spread because now we have a global economy. People get in airplanes, and what's uh, going on in Hong Hong Kong can be in Boston uh, within uh, hours. So things have really changed a lot, and we are seeing a lot more difficult to treat, rapid dissemination of antibiotic resistant bacteria uh, because of it. Now, things have also improved. We have global surveillance. There are sentinels all around the world that are constantly looking for a new strain of influenza or bird flu or a new antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria or an entirely new uh, organism. And that's an improvement. Uh, early warning systems are getting better and better. So we have time to identify the organism and respond with infection prevention measures. Diagnostics, the ability to really find these organisms, identify them, and characterize them, has totally been revolutionized. It used to take months, years even, to identify a new organism. Now using genetic testing, which I'm not going to have time to go in, into, it's sometimes just a matter of weeks before we recognize a new pathogen and identify exactly uh, what it is. So total revolution in our ability to do that. We've gotten so good with the genetic testing that we can now trace exactly where in history an organism has come from. So with Ebola, for example, I think this is right, Paul, you'll know better than I, but we can trace the history of where the current Ebola strains came from, where they deviated from the old strains, and this is true of TB and bacteria. It's a kind of revolutionized our understanding of how these organisms develop and spread. 
Uh, and, and finally, we can now sequence the entire genetic makeup of these organisms very, very rapidly and cheaply. And this allows us to develop new vaccines and new antimicrobials uh, to uh, hit new targets on the genes of these emerging pathogens. So that's why uh, we can begin to talk about vaccines or new uh, therapeutic agents much more quickly than we have in the past. Now, I just thought I'd give you some examples. This is shared by a brilliant uh, colleague of mine, John Brownstein, uh, at Children's Hospital at Harvard. A uh, Google scholar it has gotten a lot of funding to uh, figure out how to rapidly trace the dissemination and spread of organisms globally. Uh, this is a map of the global migration of pilgrims during the Hajj. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of crowding uh, at the Hajj as people gather uh, for that uh, uh, for, the, for their annual pilgrimage, and uh, meningitis, meningococcal meningitis, uh, MERS-CoV, which is a virus that recently emerged that causes influenza-like syndromes. Knowing where people go and very rapidly tracking them is really important for predicting where problems are going to be happening and beginning to institute control measures uh, promptly. Uh, here's uh, uh, where people go who visited Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, and this is a specific mapping of that MERS uh, virus that uh, uh, spread uh, recently and caused a lot of alarm, but seems to have quieted down a bit. Uh, and finally, uh, here's a map of global patterns of air travel out of Hong Kong so that uh, when the SARS uh, began to appear or when bird flu was a issue which tends to emerge in uh, that part of the world, uh, tracking air travels and, see, and seeing where are people actually going and where's the hot spots likely to be is important. You'll remember in Ebola that the CDC designated uh, certain areas as highest risk for the importation of people coming from Western Africa so that they could concentrate initial uh, control measures there. Uh, so this kind of mapping and modeling has been very, very important in shortening our response time and making it possible for us to contain epidemics as they occur. All of that said, all of these advances, don't kid yourself for a minute. Bacteria and viruses, these pathogens are quick. Uh, they mutate rapidly, they disseminate rapidly, and we're always, it seems, and will continue, I think, for quite some while to play catch up. So be afraid, be very afraid. Uh, and <laughs> Now, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Megan, who's going to introduce herself and talk about very important pathogen, tuberculosis. So um, I'm Megan Murray. I, uh, as you already heard, I'm a professor of global health and social medicine. Um, like Don, I'm an infectious disease physician and an epidemiologist. And uh, over the past oh, 15, 20 years, I've really focused on tuberculosis. So I'm only going to be talking about TB today. I think you're free to eat. You don't get TB from eating. So um, eat, drink, but, but just be careful. Um, had we met uh, for a meeting like this 100 years ago, um, at least some of us, and probably many of us, would be destined to die from tuberculosis. In the U.S., at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, TB was the leading cause of death in young adults and older adults and, and even in children. It's hard to believe when you look at this decline uh, that TB is almost uh, such a rarity in the U.S., and, and this is data from England and Wales where it's very similar, that, that people often don't recognize it when they see it. But that's not true in many of the countries uh, in, in the world and many countries that we work in. Um, there are several reasons why TB has risen in those countries. Some of it's due to HIV. And there's been an epidemic of multidrug resistant TB, which I'm going to try to explain as we go. But you'll notice that the decline in TB uh, began at least at the turn of the century. Actually, it began about 30 or 40 years previously. And there were small spikes around the time of the both world wars. But the decline continued and really um, has continued with a few bumps along the way. <clears throat> 
So to understand why TB rages in some parts of the world and is really declining at this incredible rate in others, we really just have to, to, to think about the natural history for a moment. So let me take you back to some science here. TB is a bacteria. Uh, it is a kind of a special bacteria because it has an uh, unusual cell wall that protects it from the environment. And it is a respiratory bacteria, so it's spread um, from the lungs of a person with active TB uh, to someone else. When that person coughs, sneezes, talks, sings, actually singing is a very good way to aerosolize TB. Um, and what that does is it, you know, it, it takes a bit bacteria from the lungs, puts it into the atmosphere, and then these little droplets, which you can't see, they're so tiny, slowly dry out, leaving this waxy TB bacteria in the environment. So someone might come in uh, to a room where someone has coughed, put TB bacilli in the, into the air, and breathe that air in and, and become infected. So when we talk about behavioral risk factors for infectious disease, the behavior here is breathing. Um, it, it's very hard to avoid breathing, and there, there, there's, it, it's, a, it's something that we, we all do. Um, once a person has taken that, those bacilli into their lung, they, a couple of things happen. First, the body slowly mounts an immune response, much more slowly than for other organisms, partly because, again, of this strange cell wall that is pe peculiar to TB. But that immune response sends cells into the lung, which then uh, wall off the little section where uh, TB has landed. And in most cases, the vast majority, in fact, that will constrain uh, the further replication of, of the bacteria. It, unlike many other infectious diseases, however, it doesn't kill the bacteria. It doesn't sterilize the lung. And TB remains alive, uh, dormant, in the lungs of most infected people for the rest of their lives. We learned this back in the 30s and 40s when people did autopsies on, on people who died um, of apparent other causes and found that most people who died in the 30s actually had dormant TB in their lungs. Didn't cause them any problem. Uh, they, their immune responses uh, held for, for many years, and they did fine. About 10% of people, however, have an immune response that doesn't prevent replication. So something's wrong with their immune response, or, or perhaps not, but we don't actually understand exactly why. But about 10% of people go on over the, about six months to two years to develop a respiratory infection that slowly expands and eventually is, uh, destroys the part of the lung where it, where it resides, causing big holes in the lung, something we call cavities. Those cavities are filled with TB bacilli, or bacteria. And again, when, when they, those people start to cough because of the irritation in their um, respiratory tract, they're bringing up enormous quantities of those bacilli. Just to get a sense, it can be up to a billion organisms, uh, so 10 to the 10th or, or more, uh, in the lung of a, of a person with active tuberculosis, which we'll come back to in a moment. So uh, those people um, wh who have active TB then spread it by coughing. The people with dormant TB can develop TB later in their lives if their TB reactivates. So if there's some kind of um, problem that they have with their immune system, whether it's taking drugs that are immunosuppressive for cancer or having an organ transplant or something much more subtle like having uh, you know, weight loss or, or something, they can reactivate their TB. And that's why we see TB sometimes in the elderly. Uh, and that also can be quite infectious. So what can we do about it? Well, there's two main ways to approach TB. The first is to treat it. There are, fortunately for us, a number of very good drugs. Um, we take uh, the standard therapy for TB is four drugs, which, uh, again, I'll return to in a moment. Um, they're available, they're cheap, and they're very effective. Uh, those those first-line drugs, as we call them, are pretty safe. If one develops drug resistance, one goes on to some more complex drugs. And, and, and again, we'll get into that in a moment. The other thing we can do is we can vaccinate people. There is a vaccine for TB, and if, if you were born outside of the U.S. or outside of Holland, you probably got that vaccine called BCG at birth. Uh, it's a good vaccine for, for very young children. It prevents severe forms of TB in kids under about two, but it is less effective in adults and probably has very little impact on the transmission of TB in adults. So 
why do we see this differential in different countries? Is it due to the access to care and, and BCG? Well, let me show you when those things came, came, became available. Uh, the first TB drug was streptomycin, which was invented in the 40s and tested in the 50s, in the 1950s. And we do see kind of a steeper decline in TB at that point. But TB had been declining for quite a long time before drugs were available. And similarly, although BCG was invented in about 1920, it wasn't widely used until the 1960s. And we see another little decline, but, but not much compared to what had happened previously. So what was happening previously? Well, much of our research focuses on identifying the determinants, the factors that contribute to the progression of, of tuberculosis. So some people get infected, they don't progress, these 10% or so people do progress. W why is that? There's a whole series of different risk factors. They can be individual or host risk factors. So some of those are malnutrition or even low BMI. Uh, HIV is an extraordinarily strong risk factor for the progression of TB. Being infected with uh, worms, uh, hookworms, something one can get through, the, through walking barefoot in, in endemic countries, increases the risk. Smoking, alcoholism, human genetics. It's also related to the environment. So in, in places where there's crowding and this respiratory uh, uh, bacteria can be killed by sunlight, in crowded rooms in, where uh, there's little ventilation, we often see a spread of these uh, bacteria. The use of cooking fuel, um, so most people in the world use either wood or dung as cooking fuel. Um, so they are, even if they don't smoke cigarettes, they're massively exposed to uh, something that's very much like cigarette smoke, and that's a very strong risk factor for TB. If you look on the other side about health services, so one of the things we know is that in communities where people don't have access to care, they present late they have trouble finding, uh, finding care to get it all. And when they do, they've had more time to spread disease. And um, in, in those places, we see a higher incidence of tuberculosis. If drugs don't work in those contexts, and, and many drugs don't work, there's counterfeit drugs, there's poor quality drugs, then they're also not going to be cured and they're going to continue to spread. So if you look at this constellation of risk factors, most of them are associated with poverty. And that is uh, a good uh, deal of the explanation for this differential we see in different countries. Malnutrition, helmets, biomass fuel use, delayed diagnosis, poor care. In fact, if you take a map of the gross national product of all the countries in the world and map TB incidents against it, it's almost a perfect line. So uh, the, probably the best predictor of what countries will have the highest incidence is simply their GNP. So if you look here, India um, is number one up there, the big, big circle, uh, China uh, halfway down. This is a little bit old. USA, we, we see very little. The countries to the, your left of, of India are, are mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. So let's turn to talk about drug resistance. You've probably heard in the newspaper a great deal about multi-drug resistant and extensively drug resistant TB. Um, Don started to introduce the whole idea of drug resistance, but it's not a new phenomenon, as he already mentioned. This is uh, um, uh, uh, George Orwell, who wrote 1984, and he wrote this in 1948 in a letter to a friend. He had tuberculosis, like many uh, poets and authors um, of the 20th, 19th, and 20th century. This disease isn't dangerous at my age, he says. He was referring to the fact that children tend to have worse outcomes. Um, and they say my cure is going quite well, though slowly. We are now sending for some American drug called streptomycin, which they say will speed up the cure. So streptomycin was uh, entered a cl the first clinical trial of any drug in the 1950s. Um, and on, while it was found to effectively uh, treat TB in everyone, almost everyone in that trial who was, was treated, it also happened that within six months, every single patient had a relapse of their tuberculosis. Why? They, everyone had developed drug resistance to, uh, to streptomycin. George Orwell went on to die from tuberculosis two years later. Um, so we know that uh, treating TB with a single drug w will lead to drug resistance, but let me go through how that happens. Uh, again, Don already, uh, already described it, but I, I want to go through some, some detail. So mutations occur. 
Um, mutations occur because of genetic errors. They occur in humans. They occur in everything that replicates. Um, and when they occur, they introduce a genetic variation in, into the population. So most of the drugs that we use for, for TB and other uh, organisms target specific processes in those organisms that are essential for that organism's survival. So for example, the, the cell wall, you need a, a solid cell wall for bacteria to live, otherwise it'll get taken too much fluid and blow up. If we can damage the cell wall, if we can t make the organism uh, fail to make part of it correctly, then we can treat the disease through, through that organism. But if the organism mutates or requires a mutation that prevents the binding of the drug to the cell wall, then the, cell, the, the organism can't get into the cell wall to, to undermine it. So some of these mutations, which are often, often hurt organisms, in the context of being treated with antibiotics can actually do them benefit. This is a cartoon where if you start out with a mixed uh, population of beetles, and birds like to eat them, but they only like to eat, uh, let's see, the, the green ones. So think of those as, as the drug-sensitive organism. The, the antibiotic is the bird. It's killing all the drug-sensitive organisms. If that goes on, then you're left with only drug-resistant organisms. So you take a billion TB bacilli, you're going to have some mutations, just like if you take a billion people, there are going to be some odd-looking people out there. Not very many, uh, but there will be some. If you have a mutation too that will prevent uh, the one uh, antibiotic from working, it, you know, if you think a billion, a population of billion, you're covering pretty much everything. And if you then treat with antibiotics, you're expecting that with one antibiotic that there's going to be at least one organism out there that's going to do fine and then grow back up. How do we deal with that? We treat with multiple organisms, with, um, mul 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 excuse me, multiple antibiotics. We, for TB, we treat with four simultaneously, hoping to get the, that we will not find a single bacilli out there that is resistant to all four organisms. And so even if it's resistant to one or two, the other uh, uh, antibiotics will kill it. Same idea for HIV. We, when, when Paul and I started practicing infectious disease, we were at the beginning of the HIV epidemic and when we first had one drug to treat uh, HIV. So we were treating our patients with AZT and they did well for a few months and then within the year they would return with HIV back because they all developed resistance to, to AZT. A few years later, the, the, the enormously important discovery was made that if you treat people with, with HIV with four drugs, you can overcome this drug resistance problem. So on a social level, we have this biological process, but how does drug resistance really develop, especially to TB in individuals? Well, there's two ways. One is that people can take, instead of taking their four antibiotics, they're somehow only seeing one at a time. So how does that happen? Well, there's a lot of ways it can happen. People can get the wrong therapy, and in many parts of the world, that's exactly what happens. Because, as I've already mentioned, drugs might be counterfeit, they might be poor quality. They may have trouble adhering to their organisms, to their antibiotics, because it's hard for them to, to seek care. Uh, they might have other social problems. They might live far from care. They might not be able to afford to access clinics where they would get care. They may have comorbidities. So people with HIV, uh, with um, diabetes, don't absorb drugs as well as others. If they're not absorbing the full complement of drugs, they're not seeing those drugs. All of those lead to individuals selecting for antibiotic resistance. But then, as you see in the second step, once someone has antibiotic resistance, they can, it can spread. Uh, and that is one of the things that our group has worked a great deal on, is trying to define how much uh, um, drug resistance is due to the spread rather than the individual um, acquisition of resistance. And it turns out that in the same kinds of environments we've talked about, crowded, poor environments, drug resistance TZ spreads dramatically. And the, because, it's, because we don't quickly diagnose it and treat it, but it's much harder to diagnose and treat, there's a much longer time during which people have drug resistant TB than sensitive TB, so it spreads all the more. That leads to this kind of map where you see uh, the dark blue is, are the, the countries in the world where MDR rates are the highest, 
uh, and the white are the, are the areas where there's no data. You see in part, most of sub-Saharan Africa, we just don't know how much drug resistance there is. And in places like the US uh, and, and, and la large parts of Latin America, uh, we see this fairly low. These, these estimates are really conservative because they're only measuring drug resistance in new cases, in people who relapse, the rates are even higher. So that currently, the rates of multi-drug resistance, so resistance to at least two of the most important drugs to TB, is up to 50% uh, in Eastern Europe and, and Russia. So just quickly in the last few minutes here, what happened in these sites? Well, Russia, as you probably know, uh, Russia, the, the Russian um, the state collapsed in the late 1990s, uh, and the economy followed. So after um, the after the change in the government in, in Russia, the economy was so bad uh, for the next 10 years that uh, and it had a massive impact on health that male uh, mortality, which had been in the 70s, so people lifespan people usually live to about 75 pre prior to 1999, fell to 57 in the matter of a few years. Uh, many people were. Um, uh, jailed and imprisoned because of a crime that was related to economic circumstance. And those prisons were hotbeds of tuberculosis transmission and, and reactivation. So think about it. Back in, you know, in the 40s in Russia, the, the, Russia was devastated, but of course in, in World War II, lots of people had tuberculosis. Those, many of those people spread the disease. It remained dormant in the lungs of a, a, a good deal of the population. But TB rates were really low by the mid-1990s. In the economic crisis that followed, reactivation of disease occurred. It occurred in prisons. People infected each other in prisons. They did not receive good care uh, in most circumstances. And then they went back out to the community now with drug-resistant TB and ignited a, a, a widespread transmission of that the very serious organism. So we see these kinds of numbers. In South Africa, uh, it was a different kind of dynamic. In South Africa, the rise of HIV um, led to the, the real um, kindling of a, a TB epidemic. And uh, people found that they didn't have access to good care, especially in rural areas. But, the, um, but hospitalizing people with HIV who, who also had tuberculosis uh, led to exposing them to each other so that um, people came into the hospital with HIV, they met other people with HIV, and TB, and especially MDR and then XDR TB, so uh, TB that was resistant to four or five drugs, began to spread rapidly. And because of the combination of HIV and TB is a very um, potent one for, for a very virulent organism, a uh, combination of organisms, there were extremely high death rates in that setting. Um, lastly, I just want to point out Peru, where we work. Uh, Peru is a place where drug resistance is not as high as it is in Eastern Europe. But in the pockets of Lima, where we work, in shanty towns where uh, villagers have come into the city to escape political violence in the, pa in the past 20 or 30 years, there is a very high rates of, of uh, TB and, and uh, enormously high rates of, of drug resistance. So I'm going to, to, my time is just about up, I'm going to um, let Paul Farmer, who follows, give you some ideas about what we can do about both TB and other organisms, because uh, the, the theme is going to be the same. Um, we can address some of these problems, but we need to do so rec recognizing that poverty is driving the, the, the spread of TB and the development of drug resistance and that any solution to that problem has to take uh, that poverty into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to echo and amplify um, the message of both Don and Megan and, uh, and just start with, uh, I will focus on Ebola. I had a chance, thanks to Gina uh, and Angela, to, to speak in this series about Ebola. And now I'd like to get back to the question we were charged with. You know, what causes epidemics? What, what causes disease to spread? Because that used to be, as Don said, and 
looking at the plague doctors with the mass, that used to be a theological question, right? Or um, as opposed to an epidemiological one after uh, John Snow and then later uh, a, a lot of innovators in medicine uh, helped give birth to modern microbiology and, uh, and later to uh, modern clinical medicine. Um, but I want to stick with this uh, illustration as, my, as, as Megan did looking on uh, at tuberculosis uh, to go back to Ebola. First, I just want to say one of the answers to that question is, as Megan said, poor health systems. Now, that's not a very exciting discovery. I mean, in order to prevent the spread of epidemic disease, whether we're talking about SARS or Ebola or drug-resistant tuberculosis or MRSA, we need really strong health systems. That's just not a very sexy slogan. Some of my students, um, smart alecky undergrads, um, were um, saying they were going to have a go to a, a demonstration with placards that said, what do we want? Better health systems. When do we want it? Now, uh, mocking, of course, um, but, but it's true. And uh, it's not something we really learned about in medical school, right? I mean, Don, Megan, myself, we really, that's not how we approached uh, the study of clinical medicine to learn about health systems, healthcare financing, surveillance, transnational instruments that would allow us to detect um, epidemic disease and to respond promptly. We should have done more of that, and we're playing catch up in that arena as well. Now, yesterday, an, um, a group of colleagues, um, including many from Harvard Medical School, but from across the world, launched the Lancet Commission report on surgery, on global, on, on surgery, particularly in, in, uh, in low and middle income countries. Now, how is that related to Ebola or drug-resistant tuberculosis or the list of pathogens that Don mentioned? Well, again, through health system strengthening. Because in order to perform safe surgery, um, you need health systems, and you need infection control, and you need staff, stuff, space and systems, right? You need surgeons, for example, but you need nurse anesthetists, supply chain managers. Um, the first thing I think of that most doctors trained or working at Harvard Medical School don't think about is you need electricity. I have friends here visiting from the Vassar Haiti Project. Um, that's what they're thinking of when they're in rural Haiti is we don't have electricity. So you need electricians, right? Who would have, it's not the list we make. Stuff. You heard about supply chain, um, and whether you're talking about preventives, um, vaccines are preventives, right? But so is good infection control, um, or diagnosis, identifying a pathogen as the culprit pathogen for an epidemic requires diagnostic capacity, meaning labs, or therapies. Like George Orwell, um, he, there was only one antibiotic, so of course it would fail him because we need, for the reasons Megan said, more than one antibiotics. But that's stuff that gets to move, and we need to move around. Those are, whether we call them commodities or something else, the stuff part of it is important. With the staff, but no stuff, again, it doesn't work. And then space, safe space. I mentioned already safe surgery, which was the focus of a lot of our discussions. I was a member of, the, I'm not a surgeon, I forgot to reintroduce myself. I am an, also an infectious disease doctor, but I studied, uh, I did a, a graduate studies in social anthropology, um, and um, so very different kind of training than Don and Megan on the, uh, the research side, but the same training in terms of uh, the clinical side. So I'm not a surgeon, but um, just because I'm not a surgeon doesn't mean that I don't think people should have surgical care. Um, really, I've had people say to me, why are you serving on the Lancet Surgery Commission? You're not a surgeon. And uh, I, the first couple of times I heard that, I thought it was quite startling, you know. I'm not an oncologist, but I think people, kids with leukemia, should have 
you know, diagnosis and care for leukemia, even though I'm not an oncologist. And in fact, I'm no longer a child, but I do think children should have care. <laughs> now, all that to say, that's my little introduction back to uh, surgery. And uh, because I have to tell you, even though when I graduated from college, I wanted to go to West Africa. In fact, I wanted to be a doctor in West Africa. Um, I, I applied for a Fulbright scholarship, and I thought, I'll get this Fulbright. I didn't even get an interview. So Haiti was plan B. Now, that turned out to be a good thing, and Harvard Medical School agreed and let me in. But um, I finally made it to West Africa 30 years later, um, and it wasn't because of Ebola. It was because of health system strengthening, that boring term again. Now, how did I get there, literally? Well, I went with the Lancet Surgery Commission. The first meeting, we launched it. Gina will remember this, and thank you, Angela, as well, for including me. We launched it here at Harvard Medical School. There's about 80 surgeons from across the world, and other, others, some of them not surgeons, nurse midwives, anesthesiologists, people concerned about surgical care. And the third meeting of the plenary meeting of the Lancet Commission, the Lancet, by the way, is I'm not supposed to say this at Harvard, but I was going to say it's one of the best medical journals in the world. It is, by the way. It's just that we have our own rival journal, New England Journal of Medicine. But these are, you know, it's sort of like superpowers fighting together. <laughs> in any case, The Lancet, that's it's a medical journal, a very good one, and uh, has sponsored a number of these commissions. So we had the third meeting in Dubai. Now I ask you, you start at Harvard Medical School, end in Dubai, and it's a, and it's a, a special uh, issue on surgery, surgical care in low resource or resource poor settings. Those are not resource poor settings. So the idea is that we'd have the second of the three plenary sessions in Africa, in a place there, where there isn't the staff stuff, space and systems required to have safe surgical care, right? And that's what we did. And I'd say the meeting um, was in June, and again, um, the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, which, which I chair, and which uh, Megan leads our research endeavor, um, we, we were help sponsoring it. So when, in May, it was clear that Ebola was spreading from the east, from the f this more forested region of Sierra Leone, by the way, I didn't say where. The meeting was in, in Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone on the coast. The epidemic, which I'll show you in a second, uh, started, it, this particular out outbreak um, started in the area where three countries come together, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. Now, in, in this began probably in December in retrospect. As Don says, there's been a lot of improvement in our ability to, to detect where things come from, pathogens. But it's not, in this case, particularly good. Why? Again, you don't have the staff stuff, space, and systems to diagnose the illness, much less to take care of people. So in between December, when a two-year-old child is thought to have fallen ill in a village um, in Guinea, not really in the rainforest, but close, close enough Right, his mother took him to a district hospital in a in a, a, a small city called Guecadu. Again, in that area, right where the three countries come together, and the child died. But then, so did his mother and other members of his family. And then, the reason that the illness was detected was because, as Don said, healthcare workers, professional healthcare workers were on the front lines, they started falling ill and dying. Now, get back to the Freetown meeting in June, my first trip to, to this part of West Africa, uh, even though that's where I wanted to, to start. Well, a lot of people said, well, you shouldn't have the, the plenary meeting in Freetown. It's not a safe venue because of Ebola, because Ebola was starting to march west, right? from these forests near, near these, where the countries come together, through networks, and I'll show you what I mean, through networks of connection, kinship, commerce, towards the large cities on the coast, one of which is Freetown. And it was 
the feeling of some of us that, look, Ebola is not spread, back to the question that Gina charged me with answering, how do, what causes epidemics? They're not caused by medical conferences, not usually. Now, Legionnaires, see, here I go again, always thinking, I can't get away with anything in front of my infectious disease friends because they're going to say, wait a second, what about, and then they'll name something that was spread through a medical conference, okay. <laughs> but by and large, you know, that's not how it happens. Now, so we had our meeting, and uh, there aren't a lot of surgeons, there weren't a lot of surgeons, and there aren't a lot of surgeons in this part of the world. You look at the numbers. I said the health systems are notoriously weak. And that's part of the question. Why did Ebola spread in these three countries and not so much in others? Of course, for the reasons that Don said, this is a global political economy, we knew that Ebola would be exported. And we knew it would come here as well, as it did, right? But secondary spread, you know, requires, a massive secondary spread requires an absence of staff, stuff, space, and systems. And we, we don't have an absence of staff, stuff, and spa space, and systems in a lot of places in the world. Europe, affluent parts of Asia, affluent parts of North America. They're not perfect, right? But those are places where these advances happen more quickly. But they're almost wholly absent in this part of West Africa. Now, this is the meeting, a picture from the meeting, uh, which it seems like 10 years ago to me, but it's not. And uh, one of the few surgeons left uh, in Sierra Leone was this man, Martin Salia, who, after the war ended in his home country, left like a lot of people did and became refugees. Um, I only knew really three Sierra Leoneans, all three doctors, one of them a student who's still working with us in Sierra Leone. <clears throat> but the other two died of Ebola because the frontline workers are at greatest risk. And who are the other caregivers for people when they fall ill? The main care caregivers, in fact. Your mother, right? Your family. So the main people at risk, the chief people in terms of numbers, were family members who were taking care of their, um, their sick. Now, Dr. Salia, um, was, of course, taking care of sick people in what became to be a very highly uh, affected area, which this had really never happened in cities before. And, uh, and uh, again, along with one of the people who probably knew more about viral hemorrhagic fevers than anyone in this part of the world, he, he knew how they were transmitted. He knew that he didn't have the staff stuff, space, and systems to stop the epidemic, and he didn't. He didn't have it, and he died along with much of the staff of uh, the district hospital where he worked. Now, we, a lot of us in infectious disease were, have been obsessed with Ebola for a long time. When we were training, Megan mentioned when we were training, well, that was in the early 90s, training in infectious disease, that was in the early 90s. So we saw a lot of great things happen, right? When we were medical students at places like the Brigham Women's Hospital, the Mass General, and even and Beth Israel, Deaconess, Children's. When we were medical students, what was the leading killer of young adults, infectious killer of young adults? HIV, AIDS, here in Boston. Not so much TB, although there were significant outbreaks in the late 80s and early 90s. But what happened is we saw the development of effective combination therapy. In fact, the, the term that we use in infectious disease is to describe AIDS treatment is the same term that was used to describe tuberculosis treatment, combination chemotherapy. People think, well, that's cancer treatment. No, that's, that comes from infectious disease because we learned the hard way you need multiple, you need multiple uh, drugs. Now, I wrote a book, which I'm sure you've all read, <laughs> um, probably several times, Infections and Inequalities. I mean, one chapter is equivalent to 10 milligrams of Zolpidem. <laughs> but as you notice on the cover, you know, this is an, this is an Ebola outbreak. It's a mass grave due to Ebola. And one of my, my publishers said rather wisely, it's not a good marketing strategy to put dead people on the cover of your book. And she was right, in fact. <laughs> but 
I, you know, like a lot of people in infectious disease, just marveled at the pathogens, not just the, how they acquired resistance. My major clinical field is, like Megan's, drug-resistant infections, but also how they jump from one species to another, like the zoonosis does. Probably the putative reservoir, by the way, is fruit bats, right? And so there's a lot of discussion about bushmeat. I'll go back to it in a second. But really, the main answer to Gina's question, what causes epidemic spread? is in this particular instance and many others, weak health systems. You don't have staff, you don't have stuff, you don't have safe space, and you don't have systems. So who fills in when weak, for weak health, when there's no healthcare system? Again, your family does, which is why households are mown down in this epidemic. Now, with drug-resistant tuberculosis, now let's see if I can uh, ask for a little bit of help to get this. How come mouses can't be the same? You know, is that a, it's not a lab question, Don. That is, I got it. Thank you, Cameron. Now, this is, uh, this is, again, how does this spread? Let me just first show how it does spread. And there's a lot of debate about how many times how many epidemics there have been or whether or not they've been previous epidemics in West Africa. There's some reason to think that claims that there have not been epidemics there, there are wrong, right? And that, um, but it wasn't recognized, just ignore the jargon, the medical jargon, it wasn't recognized as an epidemic until it began to mow down HCWs, healthcare workers, right? professionals, like my colleagues. Uh, both of whom were highly trained professionals, extraordinary rare in this, in this region because of out-migration after the war and failure to invest in healthcare systems afterwards. Now, MSF, by the way, means Doctors Without Borders, who presciently declared that this epidemic was out of control, which it was. Oops. Can we... Uh Okay, yeah, thanks. Is that someone else? Is that the hand of God? <laughs> this is just, this is just for you to see. There, remember I told you that little strip of land where the three countries come together, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia. A kid gets sick, taken to a district hospital like the one I showed you in the previous picture. To go, uh, first, the, kid, uh, the family gets taken out, and then the healthcare workers and it spreads along lines of commerce and kinship as people do two things. They care for the sick and they bury the dead. Those happen to be the two ways that most cases of Ebola are probably spread, right? Because it's spread through infected body secretions. Its main symptoms are diarrhea and vomiting. And again, who cleans up after you when you're sick? You answer that yourself just by thinking about when you've had vomiting and diarrhea. And it's going to either be in a minority of cases, healthcare professionals, or in a majority of cases, your family members, or for those lucky enough to be in places where there are good emergency medical systems and staff stuff space and systems to respond by healthcare professionals when it's a serious illness. So this was out of the bottle by the time. Um, I first set foot in this part of West Africa. The genie was out of the bottle. And the, the, the ways to stop it were, again, uh, similar to what Megan described for tuberculosis. You take care of people, you draw them into a healthcare system where there can be adequate infection control, which includes, in the case of this disease, what are called isolation or contact precautions, right? Now, with tuberculosis, that's an airborne pathogen. So isolation means you try and move a patient out of everybody else's airspace. Megan said, you know, you can eat the food, you can touch the doorknob, but don't breathe if you don't want to get TB, right? Now, if it's a blood-borne uh, pathogen or, or transmitted through infected secretions, you have to stop people from being exposed to infected secretions. But that's not straightforward, as we learned even in Dallas, a place where there is, in principle, staff stuff space and system. They're uh, not so evident. Now, this, this, I'm just going to 
Oops, sorry. Now, those two parts I want to mention. So, and I, I've used this uh, image before in this room. But these are people, again, I've, of course, since I'd never set foot there, how could I have met people? These are people that I met in the fall. If you keep coughing, uh, I will get a chess film right after, okay? <laughs> and those in the immediate area will do contact tracing afterwards, okay? Or as they say in regards to Ebola, don't let that woman go back to Vassar. <laughs> so, you know, I met a lot, of, a lot of people asking the same question, how do epidemics spread, including those afflicted? So there's the cover of Newsweek from the summer Right, probably just shortly after, maybe it was August, I, I'm, I can't really, I'm too old to actually see the date, but you know, you'd, you'd swear that the reason was uh, bushmeat, right? As if thousands of people suddenly went on this national or transnational and orgiastic bushmeat feast, right? But the problem was not bushmeat. It was no healthcare system worth its name, right? And not that there weren't great people in it, like our colleagues, it's two of the finest physicians around, but without the other stuff and staff, safe space and systems, doesn't work. Now these are caregivers in the sense that these are the children of people who died of Ebola, but they also got Ebola. And in almost every instance, they were grandchildren, or nieces, nephews, cousins, sisters, brothers, that's, that's the story we heard again and again. Again, they're either taking care of their mother. One of them actually said to me something I'll never forget. This is in, he said to me in November. He told me, this 26-year-old man, that he had lost in one month 22 members of his family. And I thought, how could that happen? I mean, war, genocide, maybe the tsunami. But I've never seen that before, and I've seen a lot of bad things, including the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. 22 family members. And it was the same story of taking care of people. You know, they, they, did, they didn't feel like there was an option, right? And then, you know, safe burial became a huge issue. And this was in August. So people said, well, we have safe burial. That wasn't true when his family members fell ill. So they survived in part because they were, they did receive care, but they also survived because they were young and otherwise healthy, right? And if you look at survival, it's preponderantly among young and otherwise healthy people. So that's part of how it spreads. Now, another way it spreads is poor quality medical care. This is more contentious, but it would never be contentious in a place that had all the staff, stuff, space, and systems they needed to respond, right? Like if you want to pull people into a public health system that has surveillance capacity and can inf provide infection control, you have to offer them something, right? Or they'll go hide. I've seen it again and again. I mean, Don and Megan can tell you that this was the story with typhus, yellow fever in the United States. Again and again, the public health response that was only about quarantine, well, you know, compare that to one that is able to provide quarantine and isolation and contact precautions and good care. That's where you get people to rush in promptly. And you know, this is just to say, and I'll, I'll speed this up because Gina's giving me the evil eye, is from the beginning of our knowledge of hemorrhagic fevers decades ago, there's always been enormously variable clinical outcomes. So you'll hear as on the way out of Liberia just recently, saw a sign that said, Ebola is 90% fatal. Well, yeah, it is, it is if you're Liberian, you know, or it was in the last outbreak just a month ago. 11 out of 11 in the first cluster died. But among Americans who get back here, uh, so far, we haven't lost anyone who's received this modern medical care. And that's related to how quite rapidly it spread. Well, I just want to say that systems are why this has now happened. What little there was in the way of a healthcare system in this part of the world, which has very low expenditures in healthcare, even though it had some of the rap most rapidly growing GDP, rates of GDP growth in the world. They didn't invest in healthcare, right? And so now, in Sierra Leone, the reason we had that surgical meeting there is it had, the, had no surgical care, and we wanted to see that change. The highest maternal mortality in the world, 
before Ebola. And then this is what happened, as far as we can tell, since Ebola. So the answer to my answer to the question, Gina, what causes epidemics to spread is different than in the 19th century. It's different in the early 20th century. Because there you could say, as Megan showed in looking at tuberculosis, that effective care and you know, it, uh, better diagnostics and effective care and a vaccine were not really what accounted for the drop in mortality in England and Wales, and she implied in the United States, right? But increasingly, it will be our failure to muster the adequate staff, train them and muster them, st stuff, and build safe space and real systems that can you know, respond to crises like this, which is just be beginning in West Africa. Thank you. So we have some time here for questions, and they've been forwarded to me to uh, uh, prioritize. It, it, it's hard because you've got a lot of good questions here. Uh, I'll say that there are uh, several of them that uh, reinforce some of the points that Megan and Paul and myself have made. And I'll just re briefly recap these. Somebody said you should always go away with some major lessons. If you didn't hear what Paul said about systems, then uh, you didn't hear his talk because that's so important, uh, as well as how to use those systems, how to do it when you have the systems, which we call quality improvement. Uh, and if you were listening carefully, I'm sure you've heard that poverty has very, very important role to play. So how do you build these systems when you're faced with poverty and people who are chronically underserved? And then additionally, and this was a very profound question, how do you bridge the social sciences and the medical sciences so that you can bring together the interprofessional, interdisciplinary expertise you really need to solve these problems? I think Paul is an exemplar of somebody who is a anthropologist by his initial training and has become medically very, very, very smart in ways that infectious disease are about infectious disease. And I think people like Megan and myself are constantly striving to understand how to work together with people who come from other disciplines. And, and finally, something that maybe wasn't emphasized uh, quite enough, it was stated especially because we're all praying and hoping for uh, uh, people we know or even don't know in Kathmandu and Nepal right now, is when there is disruption like that, be it in uh, Nepal or in uh, Haiti, which Paul knows intimately from the uh, cholera there, uh, or whether it's a tsunami or a uh, hurricane or a typhoon, that just exacerbates all these problems, breaks down systems, um, makes the poor even more wretched uh, in our ability to help them even tougher. So those are four really critical themes I think you've heard. And some of these questions now are more uh, specific, and I'll address them to you guys and see what you think. Um, so first of all, whoops, there, if I drop them on the floor really ask them very well. Um, so here's, here's a question. Um, uh, certain diseases seem more prevalent in a given race, uh, someone asked. And it, is that true, or is uh, race just a way to say these are people who, because they are uh, certain ethnicities or races, are living in greater uh, disadvantage and poverty? That's right. Uh, sorry. Well, I mean, I, I think it is a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, let me just say that anthropologists um, and a lot of human biologists and, and are not entirely uh, convinced that there really are races in the human species. So they're largely social constructs, right? And they, that meaning the, no the notion of race is largely a social construct, right? It changes over time, it varies from epoch to epoch. But I, I just want to start by saying, you know, in, in when you, I did my medical training, I actually started that first. When you train in, and train in both these fields together, there's a lot of, a, you know, 
um, obsession with race in the 19th century and then later in the 20th century by anthropologists, uh, you know, studying race as a social construction. So I'd be glad to talk more about that, but I'd probably make you all fall asleep or something, like my other books, which Don hasn't read, I don't think. I've read one of them. So I'm, <laughs> I, I'm but you know, um, it's been a very powerful explanatory mechanism, but it's seldom backed up by the kind of data, if, if ever, um, backed up by the kind of data. So my own uh, guess would be whenever race is invoked as uh, an explanation for either risk of infection or risk of poor outcomes, um, the next question would be, the first one, of course, as I said, is to be suspicious of the construct, but the second is, you know, if you note that it's a social construct, as I just did, then you still want to understand how does it work in our bodies, right? How does this social construction of race or racism get into our bodies as differential risk and it, for infection and differential risk for poor outcomes? Because that is a very real effect of race, mm -hmm. is increasing risk of infection, not go to tuberculosis. When you look at the U.S. numbers from that same period, right? It, as Megan said, is very similar. Declining from the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, still the leading infectious killer of young adults in Boston. Keeps on going, bumps, although not quite as dramatic, in World War I and World War II, and keeps on going down. But if you look inside, by race as then constructed, and place, Harlem, for example, you'll see that rates of tuberculosis were of epidemic proportions during a lot of those years, and then bumped again, um, not just with the advent of HIV, I'm talking about in the United States, but also with the advent of bad policies uh, that began in the 80s, you know, around the war on drugs that differentially affected young African-American men, right? So race does cause epidemics, but just not as much as racism does. Thank you, Paul. So, Megan, this is a question for you that actually is a, a kind of a very deep and important question. It's about BCG uh, vaccine. Uh, and uh, you mentioned that uh, if you were born in the Netherlands or in the United States, you wouldn't have gotten it. And, and this, this uh, individual wants to know, was well, BCG vaccine effective, especially in young children. You know, we talk a lot about, oh, people aren't getting the, their immunizations. There's a lot of fear about immunizations or the autism and all that. But he, here's a vaccine that we don't even advocate uh, here. And why is that? So there's two questions there. One is, uh, the first one was why does BCG work? So yes, BCG works in children uh, under two. So kids who are, um, who are infected with TB early in life can have devastating outcomes. They can get TB meningitis or disseminated TB. And it turns out that we don't really understand, but we know that uh, really young kids have very different immune systems than we do. So um, BCG does prevent uh, death from TB in places where TB occurs in zero to two-year-olds, but that almost never happens in the U.S. It occasionally happens. Uh, and so one of the things that BCG, BCG does is it makes the skin test for TB become falsely positive. And so in the U.S. and Holland, the public health systems decided that they wanted to be able to monitor who was infected so that they could try to treat them um, and prevent the emergence of disease. And that that was a more, it, there were more people who they could help that way than by giving BCG. So um, BCG is a, is a, you know, is a good, good drug for, or a good vaccine for, for young children probably doesn't do much for adults. One of the really interesting things about BCG, though, is that it seems to have a mortality benefit regardless of tuberculosis. So there's some new evidence that kids who get it, uh, and again, that's most of the kids in the world, um, do better even if they're never infected with TB than kids who don't get it. And we don't actually understand why, but it's a very interesting um, area of, of current research. Thank you. Uh, so uh, here's a question that I, I said that uh, HIV, Ebola, and mentioned some diseases, hepatitis, 
direct contact with blood and, and uh, Paul, you elaborated upon that and said contaminated secretions. And this, this uh, questioner wants to get really specific, uh, remembers that HIV is spread by sex and uh, wants to know about Ebola and HIV and the sexual spread of infection. Um, well, again, uh, a good question, and, um, but one that we're not really able to answer with confidence. What we can say is that you can isolate Ebola virus from, um, from semen, from urine, from stool, from blood, from if someone is intubated, uh, from endotracheal secretions, from sweat. Um, so again, bodily fluids. And there's no reason to believe that it's not spread sexually if there uh, is evidence of viable virus in um, seminal fluid, right? So that's why we say to people after they've had been declared cured of Ebola, what does that mean? It means that, that they're usually what it means is not that they're having any of these infected secretions tested, just one peripheral blood, right? So they get a blood test. You look and see with, this is a polymerase chain reaction assay, do they have uh, evidence of virus in the blood, which tends to be a yes, no answer, right? And once it's not present in the blood, it doesn't mean it's not present in other fluids. So we say, look, you know, a couple months, no unprotected sex, right? But let me just ask, how well does that work in the world? Hmm. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't doubt that there is sexually transmitted Ebola, but the great preponderance of cases in this outbreak has been, again, infected secretions um, uh, that are transmitted when you're taking care of someone who has diarrhea, diarrhea or vomiting. Um, and uh, you know, there'll be lots of speculation um, I've already, I already know uh, that in, in one of the three countries I mentioned, um, I, I don't want to say which one particularly, there have been uh, people arrested, you know, for having, you know, sexual relations uh, before that two-month period. So, you know, legislating that kind of thing is, uh, is not the best public health approach to stopping the epidemic, I would argue. Thank you. Megan, uh, you have now famously said that uh, we shouldn't breathe if we don't want to get TB. So uh, this uh, uh, individual uh, wants to protect his or herself and wonders, uh, are masks effective? Uh, well, there is one kind of mask. Is it the same person? I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> there is one kind of mask that is effective in filtering out TB, but it's hard to come by and it's expensive and it's used by a healthcare providers in places where their staff stuff space and systems and not in other places because uh, it's, like a, it's called an N95 mask that is tightly fit and has a very um, uh, tiny pores. But the kinds of masks that people buy and put on when they're doing construction or they walk around in airports with are absolutely hope, do nothing for TB. Um, but on the other hand, uh, if you want to protect yourself from TB in the U.S., I just breathe all you want. You really have very, very little chance of um, getting TB in the U.S. Unless you're in a prison. <laughs> uh, so when we see, uh, as we often do, in Japan and other countries in Asia, we see a lot of people walking around with masks in, in cities. And what, what is that all about? Is that just a cultural thing? Or are they doing it because it may protect against some pathogens, viruses, perhaps. Well, so you were mentioning earlier, Don, that, that we, there's two kinds of respiratory pathogens, those that are spread through aerosols, so breathing in air, and those that are spread through the, through the mouth and the respiratory route and the nose, but usually from somebody wiping their nose, opening a door, somebody coming by, touching that door, and then putting their hand to their face. So one thing masks do is it keeps your hands out of your face, right? You, can't, you don't stick your fingers in your mouth if you've got a mask on. Um, and that does prevent those kinds of things that are mediated by what we call fomites, which are things that are infected after one person touches someone else. 
Um, I think many people, when I visited uh, Asia and people in China and Japan are wearing those masks, I think they're, they're, some of it's from air pollution. Yeah, yeah you know, it's, uh, yeah. I do want to emphasize <laughs> that uh, thinking about how a specific uh, bacterium or virus is spread, it, it's often complicated. So when we think of the common cold virus, uh, you mentioned putting your uh, contaminated hands that you've contaminated on a doorknob or by shaking hands in your mouth. For common cold virus, actually, you can't get it through your mouth very easily. Uh, you have to put it in your nose, you pick your scratch your nose or touch your eye. And uh, it was, took a long time to prove that. On the Salisbury Plain in England, uh, around World War II time, there was a Harvard-sponsored cold virus laboratory, which tried to inoculate virus through the mouth and found they, they couldn't. They also showed that going out in the cold and getting all wet and shivering didn't cause a cold either. So, but it can be hard, as in the case, Paul, you're pointing out with Ebola, just how important is a sexual route of uh, transmission. I, I don't know if we have time for one more. Do we have time for one more? A small, a short uh, question, but this is a, a, a good one. Uh, and this one I'll uh, direct at uh, Paul. I'm very cleverly avoiding all the questions directed at me, which I think is <laughs> prerogative of the moderator. Uh, so uh, some countries or some people advocate it for banning air travel from affected countries in West Africa, whereas others said, got to keep flying, including Tom Frieden of the CDC, that they thought that was uh, counterproductive. But I showed those scary pictures uh, of air travel and, uh, and all that. Is there any point at all in trying to restrict uh, travel that way? Um, well, I, I would have to side with Tom Frieden on this one again. I'm saying again because I've sided with him a lot. A lot. You know, everything I can think of. Um, what would have been the impact of restricting air travel um, again, that's a hypothetical because we don't know, but certainly if you say, well, you know, there isn't the staff stuff, space, and system systems there, uh, and we're going to seal it off and not get it there because you can't get it there easily by ship. It may be that there are coastal cities there, but how long does it take, you know, to get things moving around to say nothing of staff? I mean, I've never gone on transatlantic travel. I'd like to. By, by boat, um, but the, the air, air, you know, air travel is the way to move all of those things. Even some of the safe space, right, was transported by air travel. So I, I think you could argue that that would have extended the epidemic, plus it would have led to more out-migration through land routes over um, and then to airports elsewhere outside of those areas. So, even if you're only interested, self-interested, you know, and thought everything was related to the, you know, protecting your own particular nation, state, or neighborhood, uh, it would have made things a lot worse. Yeah. So I want to thank the panelists uh, for uh, helping us understand the spectrum. I, I, I want to point out, Paul, that uh, this says something about our relative age because I've taken four transatlantic trips on a boat, uh, but uh, I recommend it if you ever have the time. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs>